And we're now evolving into a world where it's kind of our two views are kind of blending into where we're going, which is honestly a far darker outcome than I think either of us would have thought of 20 years ago. Unofficially, I wanted to make people understand that even for an American who's going to be relatively insulated from most of the changes that are coming is that this is still deeply personal. We're talking about the greatest changes in the human condition that we have seen at least since the Columbus expeditions. The world, the changes that we are living through right now aren't just dramatic and they aren't just deep and systemic. They are going to change the nature of everything that we thought was possible. And for most people in most countries, that is not a step forward. We then had a second Obama term where a whole lot of nothing got done in the international system and it really just started to fall apart from neglect. And then we have Donald Trump, who is kind of taking a sledgehammer to what's left. And the pace of change has really accelerated. Disunited Nations is about the countries that we think of as the owners of the future and really detailing why they're going to collapse and how these it's another set of countries that will actually rise to dominate the human condition. Well, really, it all comes down to fear and not like some sort of irrational fear like, you know, aliens or coronavirus or anything, but a perfectly reasonable fear. The American forces at the end of World War II were sweeping across Europe. And when we met the Soviets, we realized that they had conquered something like 30 times as much territory as we had in the same amount of time. And uh, the sheer volume of people that they had killed along the way, it was freaking intimidating. So the Americans knew that if it came to a straight out slugfest with the Soviet Union right after the Germans fell, that we were going to lose and lose badly. We didn't have the nerve. We didn't have the capability. We were on the wrong side of the planet. We didn't have the logistical potential. And the countries that we would have used as allies in that sort of fight had really spent the last 500 years at each other's throats. It was not exactly the sort of alliance that encouraged confidence. So the Americans had to come up with a means of motivating everyone who had seen what the Soviets had done to stand against the Soviets nonetheless. So we Americans did something that we're pretty good at. We made it about money. We created a global system where anyone could go anywhere at any time, purchase any raw commodity, ship it home, metabolize it into a finished good, and then export it primarily to the American market for hard currency. This is something that even at the height of their empire, the Brits couldn't do because there were always parts that the, the Germans or the Chinese, the Japanese controlled. At the end of the war, the US was the only Navy and we put it at the service of the global commons, which was put at the service of individual economic growth in individual countries. All you had to do was be on our side versus the Soviets. And if push came to shove, serve as cannon fodder. That was a deal that war-torn Europe and war-torn Asia jumped on. And that gave us everything from the Japanese alliance to NATO. This is the world that we know, and it lasted for a good 40 years. What's unique about the world we're in right now is the Cold War ended back in you know, the early 90s, but the Americans never bothered to update their system. We, in seven straight electoral contests, went with the candidate who wasn't interested in foreign affairs. And so the global system was just allowed to ride. And it was getting ever less attention from the United States, ever less maintenance. It started to fall apart. Countries within it thought that this was the new normal, that the U.S. would just continue doing all the heavy security lifting for everyone. And so American politics changed with it. And eventually that brought us to Barack Obama, who did nothing, and Donald Trump, who was destroying. This is where we are now. We're at the final moment of this system. The, the global order that the Americans created to fight the Soviets was the most atypical period in human history because the chief empire, if you want to use that word, didn't use it for economic imperial goals. We used it to subsidize a broad alliance globally in order to fight a single power. And then we forgot about it. Yeah, you remember the New World Order and the Thousand Points of Light? Yeah, that was, that was George Herbert Walker Bush, George Sr.'s attempt to get Americans to have an open, honest, national conversation with themselves about the sort of world that they wanted to live in. You know, how do we take this alliance, the greatest in human history, and play it forward? And so, of course, we voted him out of office. And we went with Bill Clinton, who saw himself as a leader of domestic renewal. And I don't mean to blame Clinton or even the American populace. Americans were tired of the Cold War. Living for a whole generation under the threat of nuclear annihilation, that gets a little wearing. And we thought we had escaped history. And then we escaped history again with W. And we escaped history again with Obama. And now we're with Trump. This is a natural progression. But it does mean that since 
January of 1992, the American foreign policy and security establishments haven't really gotten any meaningful guidance from the president as to what they should value, which allies matter, how they should go about doing the things that allow the United States to be the premier power. You fast forward that for 30 years. And I mean, can you imagine what your life would be if the last professional guidance from your boss you got was 30 years ago? I mean, we now have an entire generation of professionals in the military, intelligence, and foreign policy communities that have never had any sort of meaningful guidance on what the United States should be or what it should do or how it should get there. And so we get bloating in the Defense Department. We get a foreign policy system with the State Department that seems rudderless because it largely is. The intelligence community hasn't been told what is to prioritize. So we try to do everything as we did back in the late 1980s. Well, in the late 1980s, the United States was the superpower, sure, but it was very clear who the bad guys were. One of Herbert Walker Bush's last commands on his way out the door was that, you know, the Soviet Union is no longer the bad guys. We need to prepare for a new world. And rather than tell us what that new world is, rather than give him the chance to tell us what that new world would be or what it could be, he was booted out. Uh, I'm a foreign policy guy, so I obviously feel that way. I don't mean to denigrate Bill Clinton. He did something that really no one in American history has done with the balancing of the budget. Uh, unfortunately, that did not stick, but that was a huge accomplishment. And only somebody who was focused on domestic affairs could have done that. But having a framework for what we wanted to achieve and back in 1992 would have been brilliant because we were at this pure unipolar moment where everyone in the world was looking to Washington. And then Bush fell and it was just silence. There have been many along the way. And honestly, the, the day that Bush fell and it, when uh, Bill Clinton came in and his like first dozen actions were minor ideological points like gays in the militaries, for example, it was pretty clear that this is not a big picture vision guy. But if you want to talk about the points where it was very clear we were past the point of no return, you'd have to go to 2001, so 10 years later. We had three things that happened in less than a year. The 9-11 attacks, in which it became very clear that even some of our most stalwart allies weren't going to meet, weren't going to assist the United States in the way the United States expected to be assisted. We had the EP3 incident with the Chinese, where you know the Chinese are arguably the country that has benefited the most from the changes in the international system. Uh, we ended the empires, we allowed them to access raw materials and, and end markets and become the workshop of the world. But when they forced down and made the crash that EP3- The EP3 all, spy plane. Yeah, exactly, it was back in 2001. American defense planners are like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Everything about your system is made possible by the American security guarantee. And now you're saying that we want you to keep doing what you're doing, but give us all of East Asia? I'm sorry, that doesn't fly. And then the third piece, of course, was the launch of the euro, which seems very peaceable until you realize that the primary rationale for the euro currency in the first place was to carve an entire section of the world out away from the US dollar system. So here we've got 15 countries in Europe who are only existing as modern, united, free democracies because of what the United States did in World War II and with the subsequent order and their thanks is to carve chunks out of the world for themselves. Now, it's not that I don't see all these different points of view. I do. But for Americans who were still doing all the heavy lifting, who were still paying for the system, it seemed rude. And so starting in 2001 and then picking up speed ever since, Americans bit by bit by bit have lost interest in and faith in the international order. And now we're to the point where the U.S. is just you know, letting the ceiling of civilization fall. And for the countries like the Europeans, like the Chinese, like the Saudi Arabians, this is going to be a disaster because there is nothing about their economic and political systems that is sustainable without the Americans holding the center. And the Americans are leaving. Oh, it's definitely right up there. A key thing to remember that the United States has a military in it, well in excess of a million men under arms. Right now, there's only about 100,000 American troops that are stationed abroad. This is the lowest level of American deployment since the Great Depression. And at the rate that these numbers are going down, we're looking at the lowest force deployment before the Spanish-American War. So... It's not the Americans are thinking about this or in the early stages of doing this. We're in the late stages of doing this. And in the Middle East specifically, 
between the Obama administration and the Trump administration, the broad scale withdrawal from the entire region, that leaves it to the local powers, whether out of opportunity or desperation, they're forced to take matters into their own hands. And in the case of the Turks, the Turks just assumed that because the Americans under the order had always taken steps to preserve stability and in general get along with Ankara on anything that they wanted to do, they just assumed that the Americans were going to be moving in large scale and deposing the Assad regime. And when the Obama administration declined to do that, it was a shock. And when the Trump administration then says, we're going to pull out, but you don't do anything cheeky, it was almost a challenge 